Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, I have thought about this before. Interesting question. I don't know why. Maybe it's just not necessary? Uh, I don't know. Um, original link to the video, top of the description. My name's Connor, if you're new. Hope you guys are doing well. Fern, why Europe has no Hollywood? I mean, I, all I can think of is Bollywood and then the Hollywood in the USA. So maybe it's just you don't need this dedicated space to create movies. Maybe that's just not necessary. And uh, I, I don't know. Let's let's figure it out. These are the 50 highest grossing films of all time. They are all American. Hollywood rules the medium. North America controls roughly one third of the global movie and entertainment market. British, German, Italian or French cinema are not that relevant internationally, not even in their own domestic markets. Before the pandemic, US films held a market share of almost 70% in Europe. But that hasn't always been the case. Once upon a time, Germany was the world capital of film, and Europe had the biggest film industry on the planet. European film companies were technological pioneers and on the forefront of artistic innovations. They held market shares in the US of up to 50%. Then the industry went from economic dominance to insignificance in the span of just a few years. What happened? How did Europe lose its Hollywood? The answer lies somewhere between fascinating economics, geography, lobbying, politics, and an assassination. Franz Ferdinand? Okay. Understanding the what? complex history of film means learning a lot about technology and statistics. If you, like us, love these kind of topics, brilliant is just for you. Brilliant. Guys, if you heard it here and you're interested, this makes you, you know, want to get brilliant. Make sure to use the promo codes and links. Again, the original link to this video, top of the description, and you'll find that stuff over it's there. It's a hands-on platform for actively learning new skills in fields like data science well, or time statistics. To grab my coffee. There are thousands of lessons to choose from, with new ones added every month. So there's always something to explore. Drawing conclusions from big sets of data can be quite challenging. The brilliant course Data Analysis Fundamentals shows you how to analyze real data with just a few bite-sized lessons. No matter where you're starting from, Brilliant matches your skill level and interests by taking a quick quick I did not make it in time. Upon signing up, you'll be directed to the content that's just right for you. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash fern or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Oh. In 1897, photographer Edward Maybridge was hired to figure something out. Do horses have all four hooves in the air while running? He set up multiple cameras at a racetrack in Stanford, California. And in the end, he created this. The first film ever. But the rise of film Answer, did yes. not happen in the US. It happened on the other side of the Atlantic. Two brothers shaped what would later become film as we know it today. It's like Einstein. Years opened the world's first commercial movie theater in 1895 in Paris. One of the first movies they showed was this 50 second recording of a train arriving at a station. According to an urban legend, people were so afraid of the train rushing to towards them that they panicked and fled to the back of the theater. Okay, this has to be touched up, right? This looks way too crisp and nice. Train arriving at a station. According to an urban legend, people were so afraid of the train rushing towards them that they panicked and fled to the back of the theater. From here on, the international rise of cinema could not be stopped. So it's like people with VR goggles today. <laughs> Around 1900, film became a global phenomenon. Cinema flourished in Denmark, in the UK, in Germany. But it is two countries that dominated the film industry at the time. France and Italy. French film pioneered in special effects. The stage magician Georgi Miliès was the first who truly started experimenting with the possibilities of film. Italy became famous for its historical epics. The extensive use of extras and the immensely lavish sets established new production standards. He was a magician? 
like how I think of a magician, which would make sense, since, which would make sense since all like a lot of magic tricks are based off of like point of view, and he would know how to make things look, you know, as real as possible in a set. There's trust and the immensely lavish sets established new production standards. European cinema was in great shape. It quickly gained around 50% market share in the US. The European film industry drove technical innovations like projection, color processes, and sound films. They pushed new forms of content like the weekly newsreel, the cartoon, the serial, and the feature film. Feature films are what you would call today's movies. 90 minutes plus, big stories, big promo, big stars. Before that, going to the cinema was watching a bunch of 15-minute stuff randomly mixed together. Think ancient YouTube. Back across the Atlantic, American filmmakers find their paradise. If you want to shoot a movie, you need light. The easiest way to get some is the sun. If you want to shoot many movies all year round, you need a place where the sun shines a lot. Enter a small Los Angeles suburb called Hollywood. California has a vast amount of different landscapes, relatively short distances between them and perfect weather conditions. But there was another reason why the American film industry flocked to California. Thomas Edison. Edison held over 1,000 patents, many among them related to making movies. And he was not only a genius inventor, but also a ruthless businessman. Using his numerous patents, he formed the Motion Pictures Patent Company. The Hold on, before we go, I just want to say something before I forget. I'm trying to think of something in my lifetime that has had, that was a similar sort of, like, like he's saying people going to the movies to watch like these short clips and nowadays it's like why would you want to go for that but back then i'm sure it was even more exciting than going to a full you know very cgi whatever film or, you know a modern film today because it was just such a new concept maybe the internet i i guess i, I would say the internet is, is probably more revolutionary than moving pictures cinema but was it as abrupt of like, hey, look at this thing that we can do now. We can watch pictures. We can watch real time. I'm trying not to use the word video because that would be like a new thing to them. Like you can watch people in, I don't know. All right. I, it's, if anyone knows like a, an equal sort of, wow thing my vocabulary is not doing great right now sorry let's go if you can understand my question there i'd appreciate the any answers pc established a near monopoly on all aspects of filmmaking and it was notorious for enforcing their patents sometimes with the help of hired thugs before hollywood the american film industry was mostly centered around new jersey on the east coast many independent filmmakers chose to flee from the restrictions imposed by mppc to the west californian judges were said to be less accepting of edison's monopolistic practices by by 1915, over 60% of all American motion picture companies were located in Hollywood. This concentration will later... The more I learn about edit... Nosferatu, right? Remember from Spongebob. Nosferatu. Oh my god. Oh, right. The more I learn about Thomas Edison, because he's like the main sort of inventor you think of growing up. And the more I learn about him... The more I realize he was more, he seemed not just an inventor, clearly a smart man, but maybe even more so a very shrewd businessman and kind of ruthless businessman, even more so than he was an inventor. I, I'm not sure on that, but it seems that way. Proved to be an enormous located in Hollywood. This concentration will later prove to be an enormous advantage. Meanwhile, feature films turned out to be the industry's future. Longer, better films meant higher ticket prices, more people going to the cinema, and much higher profits. A race began. And for a while, the film industries on both continents were toe-to-toe, -to -toe, making more and more feature films every year. Then, something happened. Last pause, last pause. Probably not. The I'm sure that, like, the wow factor of just seeing any clips in a movie theater 
would have been great, but I'm sure it would have gone very fast from, I just want to see any moving pictures whatsoever. It's such a cool new thing to, okay, I've seen it. Now I want to see more focused things that I want to see a movie about, you know, rather than just a collection. Does that make sense? It's right. the 28th of pausing. June, 1914. A motorcade crosses through Sarajevo. It takes a wrong turn. As the cars attempt to reverse, a man steps up to the footboard of one of them, Princep? holding a gun. He shoots and kills the two passengers inside. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir presumptive to the Austro-Hungarian throne, and his wife, Sophie, Duchess of Hohenburg. Shit escalates, World War I happens. That was a quick summary. <laughs> the Shit first escalates World War, World War I. Um, had a huge effect because the film production was then nationalized in all countries which took part in this war. This is Dr. Markus Stickleger, a film professor who helped us understand the subject. Thousands of people marched to the front lines. The next four years left Europe in ruins. But that's not the full answer. Far from it. The European film industry was alive and well throughout the war. People needed entertainment in dire times. Film became a tool of war. They were government jobs. The industry even grew a bit over the war years in some countries. Nonetheless, after 1918... European film markets kept growing to the war and many large European film companies made large profits from distribution, government propaganda, newsreels, and army hardware orders. I know that Disney played a part in, in uh, World War II propaganda films. Over the war years in some countries. But that's World War II. After 1918, Hollywood had completely taken over. How? The Great following section so is largely based on a fantastic paper by Gerben Bakker, link in the description. While war was raging in Europe, the film industry in the US completely transformed. Almost all film became feature film, and feature films started to dominate theatrical entertainment at large. Regional markets became a national one, national ones became a global one. Within the span of a few years, it became insanely expensive to make movies, and therefore very risky, since you couldn't be sure anybody would watch them. But in turn, the money you could make with a successful movie was unlike anything the entertainment world had ever seen. Film production started to be all about really big bets. Smart entrepreneurs realized the potential of film. Anything with the word motion picture in it received enormous investments. Fox spent $92,000 on film production in 1914. The studio ramped that number up to 4 million annually by 1917. A casual 40x jump with the help of wealthy New York investors. I was about to say, well, you gotta, well, what's... Never mind. Uh, that Paramount was jump. the result of the merger of several regional distributors and a big feature film production company. With their united power, they started rolling out massive national advertising campaigns promoting their stars and features. As a result, the company doubled its annual revenue within two years. Paramount pioneered a new thinking. Pay directors, authors, and writers whatever is necessary to get the best material possible. The concentration of film production in a single place benefited the industry greatly as talent could easily move around, be scouted, be hired. The US film industry became the internet of the 1910s. All this money pumped into the industry of the future. So much hype, all these startups. Almost none of them survived. But okay, so I guess the internet would be a good comparison. Those that did are some of the world's biggest companies today. Same here. By the end of the 1910s, almost everybody had gone bankrupt or been absorbed, except the so-called Big Five, plus these three smaller ones. It's no coincidence. The big Five, plus these three smaller ones. Smaller ones. Columbia Pictures, Universal. What are the ones I don't really... I don't... What is RKO Radio Pictures? And I love the name because it, it shows you how... How I love when stuff is phrased like radio pictures and it gives you an idea of of what it this new thing was like to people. Oh, it's like radio, but 
it has pictures with it. <laughs> Radio pictures. That sounded so dumb, but it's uh, United Artists and RKO Radio Pictures. I don't recognize. This one sort of sounds familiar. It's no coincidence that you recognize almost all of them even today. These production companies played the game like no one else. They aggressively acquired theater chains and other distribution facilities in the US. They vertically integrated so their share of the rapidly growing cake would be ever more enormous. By 1930, the big five plus small three controlled roughly 95% of US film production and distribution back to Europe. Even though the film industry here was still alive, it didn't participate in the insane race that happened in the US. It was behind. So, so far behind. In 1919, 90% of all films screened in Europe, Africa and Asia were American. In South America, it was close to 100%. Market size mattered more than ever. You needed to show your films to a lot of people to make your money back. But the European market fell apart because of war-related animosities and regulations. As a result, in the 1920s, much of the European film industry collapsed. I feel like America kind of has a cheat code when it comes to this stuff, in that everywhere else, especially in this area, you know, this area, this giant, it, it, America lives it doesn't have to deal with the god i can't talk political worries that other countries do that are surrounded by somewhat equally or close to equally powerful countries and it's almost like if you go over here it's the Ameri what america did in world war 2 after it entered kind of shows what I'm trying to say is that America is like, it's sort of untouchable by the giant oceans, Atlantic and Pacific. And it's, just, it's an area where you can just kind of create things without the worries that places in Europe might have. That makes sense. To 100%. Market size mattered more than ever. You needed to show your films to a lot of people to make your money back. But the European market fell apart because of war-related animosities and regulations. As a result, in the 1920s, much of the European film industry collapsed. There was one exception, Germany. The only place Hollywood hadn't conquered yet because no American movies entered the country during the war. Between uh, the First and the Second World War, there was the Weimar Republic. And the Weimar Republic was still haunted by an uh, economic crisis. But the need for entertainment and especially for cinema as a factor of entertainment was huge. And um, in retrospect, you can say that uh, the Weimar Republic era was the most uh, fertile for German film history ever. Studio Babelsberg was built next to Berlin in 1912, the oldest large-scale film studio in the world. Additionally, German film production was unified under one big studio, UFA. During I wonder if a similar thing happened to Jewish scientists that fled the uh, Germany, you know, and then ended up in America, a lot of them, if the same thing kind of happened with with uh, directors. During the 20s, many talented filmmakers from Germany emerged, like Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau and Fritz Lang. Their movies were successful all across the world. Metropolis, for example, is still one of the most influential science fiction movies of all time. It was the golden age of German cinema. In theory, German- Hold on, wait, hold on. UFA. During the 20s, many talented filmmakers from Germany emerged, like Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau and Fritz Lang. Their movies were successful all across the world. Metropolis, for example, is still one of the most influential science fiction movies of all time. It was the golden age of German cinema. In theory, German movies could have flooded the US market since they were incredibly cheap because of national inflation. But it was shortly after the war, so the mood in the US towards Germany German movies was hostile at times. Also, they were quite different from Hollywood cinema and not a great fit for the American audience. 
variety noted at the time. It is a curious fact about many German pictures. They deal with freak stories and have no romance, being entirely of men. Hollywood found its classic style. German movies were often expressionist. After the war, Germany had quotas to only allow a certain amount of American movies in their market. Over time, these quotas relaxed and Hollywood seized the opportunity. The studios bought up independent theater chains and flooded the German market with their films. UFA got into serious financial trouble and got bailed out by Paramount and MGM in exchange for distributing loads and loads of their movies. This meant that less German movies were shown, which meant less revenue, which meant decline. Hollywood effectively crippled its only serious rival. Then came this guy and sealed the deal. Over the following 12 years, every film produced under the Nazi regime needed Goebbels' personal approval for release. The industry officially prohibited Jews, leading to a significant exodus of German film artists to Hollywood. In consequence, yep. Los Angeles was called no the new Weimar, and the once thriving German cinema lost its talent. The Second World War destroyed film production all over the continent. The effects of war on London, for example, or uh, later on Germany, on the bombing of Berlin, they destroyed a lot of those production facilities. So by the end of the war, film production and studios had to be rebuilt in Europe. European cinema wasn't dead, though. After the war had ended, Hollywood lobbied for film to be viewed as an economic product, not a cultural one. The studios wanted to ensure there would not be national quotas or limits, which would be incredibly damaging for them. Despite an all-powerful Hollywood, many European countries developed a flourishing film industry in the coming decades. Cinecita in Italy had great years and is currently having a comeback. UK cinema found enormous success in some franchises and is a key player in global film production today. French cinema is heavily subsidized and regularly produces international hits, ramping up to be a major international locations hub. Germany manages to land international hits once in a while, especially when dealing with its own history. Nonetheless, it was never possible to focus um, forces in the way that the American uh, film productions were able to do that in Hollywood. But why not build a union of film production, as the continent did for the economies at large? Each country has a very specific needs, very specific ideas, and it's really hard to unify European cinema as the North American cinema could be unified by language and by certain themes and as certain mythology. Though there are attempts. The European Film Agency Directors Association is trying to bring Europe's film industry closer together. By 2030, they envision European film to be globally competitive and culturally diverse. And despite Brexit, the UK is deepening its partnerships with other European film industries. So is it fair to, like, it's like if, if different states in the US all had their own film industries, And they all had their own history and and didn't want certain other states movies allowed and you didn't have that same and the fact that that isn't the case and the u.s and i guess north you know canada u.s doesn't have that restriction and, and can just you know use their or sell their movies to a much much wider audience without the same restrictions Hollywood's role and approach to filmmaking has shifted over the years. Without international co-productions, Hollywood wouldn't flourish today. So um, American film production is strongly dependent on co-producing internationally and even moving their facilities towards uh, European and Eastern European countries to be able to uh, produce on such a large scale. So American cinema is still very dominant, but like as a kind of organized focus for a kind of global cinema which connects American productions with international companies. Asian markets are now... So is Hollywood becoming more of a service industry than it is a, a product industry? By far the biggest in the world, and they are challenging the status. Asian markets are now by far the biggest in the world, and they are challenging the status quo. 
Today, Hollywood might seem like a force of nature, an inevitability. The US is the king of content and exercises enormous cultural influence, not least through cinema, despite the movies being a purely economic product, of course. But it is fascinating to realize how many coincidences and world events set the stage for this level of dominance. If market escalation hadn't happened during World War I, the industry might have been more balanced. For contrast, Becker argues the music industry exploded in the 50s and is much less centralized. What if Germany had been less weak economically in the late 20s? What if Chinachita hadn't crumbled, etc., etc.? Of course, all of this is pure speculation. In the end, we just wish we could have been there at the birth of a medium we love so much. Um, the fantastic video. The, the one thing I don't... All of this is pure cheetah. The, the one thing about speculation, like, okay, what if Franz Ferdinand wasn't assassinated? Or, okay, what if Germany wasn't as economically bad off in the 20s? What if this stuff... The, re the reason I, I don't love th that, uh, that sort of speculation is because it, it assumes that those things were in a vacuum. Like, th they were acute, uh, acute, I would say, is a good term to use. Like, um, if, so, if like an, if, if a sickness or an injury is acute in the hospital, like you have an acute injury, it means that it just arose out of nowhere or it's not exactly, it's not connected with prior stuff. And, and I just don't think that's correct. Um, it, it's suggesting that other stuff wouldn't have happened and like it, it, it's not looking at the bigger picture of hostilities and stuff that was going wrong and sort of assuming that the, the stuff that happened that could, if it were different, could have a big effect, wouldn't be replaced by something else big that would have happened. And so those comparisons, I'm not a huge, I, I don't think are logical, really. Uh, some events more than others can have a giant impact, right? It, but it, it's like saying that, if Archduke, if Archduke Franz Ferdinand wasn't assassinated, then World War One wouldn't have happened. I don't think you can really say that. I, you know what I mean? Like, it's imagining something as less of a final straw that broke the camel's camel's back, and more of a catalyst thing that happened. And certain things are more catalyst than others. I think. I hope I'm using the right words here. And so, this isn't really about the whole video i don't want to make it my closing statement here uh really interesting and it seems like a large bit had to do with less volatility in american markets over the time when cinema was com becoming big compared to the more volatile atmosphere in, in europe as cinema was becoming a big thing that that seems to be the general big difference that i've noticed in the video awesome video uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Fern, great channel. Love you all. Hope you guys are all doing well. If you're not doing well, chin up. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. Yeah, I would appreciate any comments, guys. You're, you're always so great down in the comments. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next video. Bye, guys.